All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us for Archive Dives with Oxen AI. Um, every week, we take a deep dive into a different machine learning research paper hosted on Archive. This is something that we started doing internally as an Oxen team, um, just to like refresh ourselves on the foundational papers and the literature and stay up with you know new research trends, because it feels like there's a huge new foundational paper dropping every two days at this point. Um, so a quick note on the format, um, we sort of published the paper in the invite, you maybe saw it, it's the Latin diffusion models paper um, that kind of spawned the stable diffusion series of models. Um, we have read that paper as the Oxen team, if you guys did, that's great as well. If you didn't, that's also totally fine. Um, we'll spend the first 20 or 30 minutes uh, going over the paper and feel free to just jump in uh, with any comments or suggestions or corrections or just applications to your work um, at any time. Time. And then there'll be kind of a more uh, freeform period for, for discussion after. So sound good with everybody. Cool. I will start sharing my screen. Great. And then Scott, if you don't mind sending this in the chat to the Notion nope. page. Sweet. Cool. So um, as I mentioned, the paper that we're going over today is high resolution image synthesis with Latin diffusion models, um, more commonly known for the applications that it has spawned, which is the open source um, series of stable diffusion models. And this was published in December of 2021, which kind of like feels like forever away in AI time. Here is a diagram going over the model architecture that I find very useful after reading the paper, but not so useful before reading the paper. Um, so we will kind of break this down bit by bit and then come back at the end and hopefully be able to kind of piece together um, what each of these many components is doing. Um, first, I want to take a quick peek at the applications that this paper enables. Many of you have probably played with something like this before, but it's fun just to kind of get ourselves set. So this is a running example of one of the more up-to-date stable diffusion models. And you can generate an image of anything you want um, from a prompt. So if you guys could put some prompts in the chat, and I will take the first one of any image that you want to see, and we can just generate it on the fly to kind of get an initial sense of, of what this thing does. Anybody? Don't be shy. I like it. So Scott had us put in a robot making a cup of matcha. In later generations of the model, you can also enter negative prompts to condition the generation on things that you don't want to see. Like if you wanted this to be uh, a cartoon style, you could, um, you know, say a photorealistic. You could put photorealistic in the negative prompt space. Ah, uh, Jessica. Okay, we're going to add an extra eleven seconds to one to see that after. So. Um, as you can see, it's going to generate four images for us. Definitely knows what a robot is. Also definitely knows what matcha is. This is not too bad overall, I would say. This one might give us something somewhat frightening, uh, but I'm excited to see where it goes. Oh, OK. <laughs> That's tough. Um, some some things, you know, based on the training data distribution, it is better at than others for sure. But it was nice to see kind of the full breadth of the things that it can and can't do. Uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about why. Um, I'm going to increase my font size just a little bit. Great. So a couple of things that I thought were noteworthy after playing around with this for a little bit that will kind of come up as we discuss the model architecture. The first one seems pretty obvious but it's that we are actually able to condition the image that's being generated uh, using text. That's why we're putting in prompts. This is not, hey, generate me a random image, and we keep doing that infinity times until we hope that there's a newborn baby on top of Everest. Secondly, um, the generation speed of this model, at least in kind of my subjective UX opinion, is pretty fast. So this is talking about 11 seconds to generate four 768 pixel images. Um, and of pretty high, you know, photorealistic, if occasionally flawed quality, um, via a free, free and unlimited hosting service, just feels pretty incredible to me. And we'll see more incredible as we go back into the background behind these models. 
Um, and then the generated images, obviously, especially in the baby case, uh, not perfect, still a long way to go, uh, especially at representing humans. Um, but one thing that I think is interesting in comparison to the previous generation of state-of-the-art image generation models, which are from generative adversarial networks, which we'll talk about later, um, is that they tend to be more free of any specific um, artifacts, such as this tiling one that I've showed here that can come from the convolutional structure of the neural networks that are used to generate them. So overall, they can look a little messed up sometimes, but are less you know, likely to be very obviously um, carrying over artifacts from the training process. So when I look at a paper like this, I like to be like, why are we reading it? Why is this such a famous paper that's getting cited a lot? And some you know, papers will introduce new model architectures entirely. Some will introduce new optimizers. And this one does, in a sense, introduce a new model architecture, um, but it builds on the core of a diffusion probabilistic model. Um, which was you know, a state-of-the-art model at this time in terms of raw image quality that it was producing, um, but it had a big drawback, which is that you know, compared to those GANs that we were talking about earlier, the previous state-of-the-art, it was massively more computationally expensive to achieve, um, not really practical to do at all. And by you know, introducing like one cool trick that doctors will hate you for or whatever, um, the team behind this paper is able to increase the performance or sort of maintain that existing standard of high image generation quality, um, but massively, massively decrease the computational costs such that this is something that's practical to run. You know, we have a Slack bot that runs it in Oxen. We just ran it in the browser in 11 seconds. So they refer to this as kind of a core goal and output as democratizing high resolution image synthesis. And I think that they have achieved this. I don't know if anybody in the call was on Twitter when these models initially dropped, uh, but at least my feed was very full of people exploring with this. And I think it's really helped, uh, helped the kind of image processing side of machine learning, which is where my background's from, live up to kind of the hype that the GPT series of models got in language, which is cool. As for the core mechanism that allows them to achieve this, this is kind of a high level look, but we'll dive a lot deeper. Um, in short, it is a form of encoding or downsampling or dimensionality reduction. We can talk about this in a lot of different ways. But basically, the core thing that's happening is instead of performing these operations through the diffusion model on a full image of you know, 256 by 256 by 3 for R, G, and B pixels or even larger, we are first taking that data, reducing it down to a much smaller representation while still maintaining as much of the kind of underlying information as possible, and then running our diffusion model on that, which allows us to do it a lot more quickly um, and a lot more accurately as well. Any questions kind of on that setup uh, before we dive in? I have a diving ox. I thought this one worked quite well. The eye's a little odd, but besides that. So to understand Latin diffusion models, I think we first need to understand diffusion models, which I said are kind of the backbone on top of which this is all built, right? The major improvement that this makes. And a diffusion process is an iterative process by which you take you know, a, a, a real life image or really any image, but an image that has solid sig signal in it, such as this image of a cat, and you iteratively add more and more random stochastic noise to the image until you reach a point where that image has been, essentially the signal is completely destroyed, right? It can't be recovered because it's completely indistinguishable from, from random noise at this point. As you can see, you know, there's this distinction between a forward diffusion process, which is where we are adding noise to destroy an image, um, and then a reverse diffusion process where you are taking a noisy image or sometimes in the case of you know, diffusion network inference, your noise and translating it back semi-magically um, into a real uh, you know, signal image. And this seems magic at first, and we will get under the hood of it. Uh, but like I said, the goal is to kind of create a neural network which is able to facilitate this reverse diffusion process on a noisy image. We want to go from noise to image. Um, and the way that we do that is through a variety of steps, unsurprisingly involving large convolutional neural networks and a lot of training data. So how the model does it. First thing, like in any project like this, is to take a lot and it's sort of a diverse array of high quality training images like that cat above or like the shore that we have above. Then we will kind of facilitate that forward diffusion process by applying various intensities of noise to those images. So it's not always going to be all the way to this X of T where the signal is completely destroyed. Sometimes it'll just be a little bit of noise. 
And when we add that noise, we want to keep track within our modeling pipeline of the actual noise that was added. Again, the noise that we're adding is kind of randomly generated, but we know what it is so that we can kind of help the model learn uh, to predict it. The model will make a guess about what noise was added, what part of the image is noise. And if you know the noise that was added, you can take the noised image, subtract out the noise, and get back to what the model thinks is a reasonable recreation of the input image. So we added some noise. We had the model guess what noise we added. It'll be pretty bad at it at first, but like any computer vision or machine learning application, we can calculate a loss function, evaluate the performance of the model, and sort of train the model iteratively hundreds of thousands of times to step in the right direction um, to a point where it is able to predict the noise that was added to the model. That's a little hand wavy, I am aware. So do we have anyone with questions at this point before we move on to you know, Latin diffusion models from just our plain diffusion models? Comments welcome as well. Cool. Kind of mind blown already. <laughs> <laughs> it's wild. David, what's up? This unit ner unit network isn't like uh, what bits to bits use when trying to convert some image to another field of that image. Bits to bits use unit network like the same way the same way that stable diffusion use it right yeah i actually find them popping up the, the unit um, convolutional backbone of all of this popping up in a ton of applications that are involving like image to image stuff because the kind of magic thing about it is that it's fully convolutional so whatever size image you put into it it comes out on the other end the same size there's no kind of uh you know additional fully connected layer at the end where the image is being stretched out into a series of pixels so that's why it pops up so much, at least to my understanding, in uh, in image to image work like this. Bart, what's up? Hey, uh, just a quick question. Um, curious on what techniques do you typically use uh, for reinforcement learning, um, or you know, uh, just just to help help the model, um, you know, iteratively uh, improve? Are you can you can you kind of expand on you know, you know, the gradient descent technique? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm. I could be, I could have read this wrong, but to my interpretation, there's not any like more traditional like reinforcement learning that's being used. It's primarily just as these predictions are happening. So, you know, we'll start with a neural network that has lots of flexible parameters that are able to, uh, you know, change and, and iteratively, iteratively move themselves in, in various directions to learn signal in the data. We'll start by, you know, giving, feeding into that model um just those noised images it'll try to predict that noise that was added um it'll go very wrongly at first which is totally fine um but based on the predictions that it's made we're able to through you know the process of gradient descent or back propagation which again waving hands but takes you know involves taking a lot of derivatives of of the functions that are being computed backwards through the model we can say hey you were wrong with this prediction again i'm anthropomorphizing here too you were wrong with this prediction but you were wrong in this specific way so these parameters can start to adjust back towards being able to more accurately predict um, the noise at each step and the the hope is and and the you know reality is um that as you do that more and more, they're eventually able to nudge further and further towards kind of accurately understanding the signal of the underlying data set that you're using and what the noise that is added to that data set looks like. Does that make sense? Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll wait for you to expand kind of in the, uh, in the next uh, next section, but thanks. Totally. Also, I mean, I'm happy to happy to do it more here if, if there's anything specific I can help with. Yep, appreciate it. Great. So, um, onward to kind of the core mechanism behind the latent diffusion models and, and what makes them unique, what makes them different than just diffusion models. Um, so just kind of an overview of how we feel about these diffusion models in general. Um, I think their mechanism is very interesting. I know Jessica said it was like, this is wild. Um, and the benefit as well is that they're able to produce pretty high quality um, you know, samples under the right training parameters. Like we said earlier, they're already more resistant than the previous state-of-the-art GANs to some of those training artifacts. Um, they also have another noted advantage that comes up in the literature a lot um, versus GANs, which is that they're not susceptible to a common training fault called mode collapse. A quick overview of GANs is you can think of them as having two competing neural networks, one of which is trying to, you know, it's taking in data from the training set and trying to make images that look, excuse me, as close to the training set as possible. <clears throat> 
Um, and then the other network is trying to tell what's real original data and what is kind of fake data that's been generated by this model. One downside of that is if the generator half finds that it's able to make one particular image or one particular face that is really good at fooling the other network, it can just start making that face over and over. No matter what input you give it, it's going to predict that face, which we can see happening here, right? At 100 passes through this network, um, we have a nice variety of faces, and then through 199, and then eventually over to 300, it starts to collapse and focus in on to that one optimum sample. But obviously, we want a network that is able of you know able to provide kind of a greater you know greater diversity of training samples and and respond um, across a wider variance for us to be using it to generate things. So this is great. We're happy that it does not is not as susceptible to this as GANs are, uh, but there is still a big need of improvement. And as I said at the top. Um, the biggest issue is that this model is extremely computationally expensive to run. Um, and the main reason for this is because that denoising process that we're doing, that kind of um, back propagation, all of those gradient calculation operations are operating at the pixel level. So when we have our denoising network that's going to go through a series of iterative steps to remove the noise from that model, um, it's taking in the entire image if say you know as it was in this case 256 pixels tall 256 pixels wide and three pixels deep for each of the three color channels um, that's just a lot of data to be moving through this network um, especially because there is you know a lot of information that needs to be calculated to go from you know noise to to true signal here so this means that in our training process we're starting from full color images at whatever size you know we want our generated images to be and at inference, when we're trying to generate a new sample, we start with a full size just shot of 256 by 256 by three noise. Um, and we have to put that in and the denoising process, rather than operating on a smaller sample of that, has to operate on that full noise patch, successively denoise it, which again, is pretty computationally expensive. This yields, you know, inaccessible to use the author's terms, um, generation times on, on you know, reasonable hardware um, for small images and then scaling to the types of images that we'd love to have as our like computer wallpapers um, is just not particularly reasonable um, under that current architecture because you can imagine how quickly those pixels start to add up. This is where the Latin part of the Latin diffusion models uh, saves the day. Just a warning, I'm going to go back and forth between saying Latin and Latin probably five or six times. Uh, so prepare yourselves. But the way that we solve the kind of core computational challenge here is by compressing the data, um, the image data, into a Latin space so that the actual diffusion process is able to operate on kind of a smaller, um, a, a smaller data object. So the authors talked a lot throughout the paper, if you've read it, around like perceptual equivalence and perceptual similarity. Um, and that's because a large, por that's kind of referring to the fact that a large portion of the information that's present in these images um, is not stuff that is particularly important for us to identify them as a high quality generated image, right? This is not a direct, but an intuitive example, which is if you think of, you know, a time in your life where you've had a five megabyte image taken on your phone and you're able to kind of compress that through a variety of means to an 800 kilobyte image uh, while still having that recognizable as the same image to us. There's a lot of data there that's kind of being transformed. And part of that is, is storage mechanisms as well. But you can also think of aspects that matter um, about an image uh, as far as us being able to recognize it as a coherent and, and you know, stylistically consistent generation, such as for humans, you know, having a, a face that is roughly oval shaped and two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. When we were generating oxes uh, or oxen, uh, having four legs and two symmetrical horns, um, and then the kind of the overall symmetrical and, and proportionality properties of the image. These are things that affect how we as humans perceive image quality. But there's a lot of additional information in the images that uh, doesn't matter as much, but the model can still really focus in on and, and kind of almost lose its way by majoring in the minors to some extent. These can include things like on, on a small scale, like the slight difference in brightness or saturation of an image could not mean that much to us um, as humans identifying an image, but it could mean a lot to the model and the model could spend a lot of time trying to understand based on the training data and the kind of recreation error metric, what is, you know, what is real and or what matters and, and what doesn't. The authors talk about this a lot because they say that when these diffusion models operate in pixel space, the model has to spend a lot of time kind of sorting through and learning these very small, not as perceptually relevant features before eventually getting to the core lower level representations. So the fix that they propose for this is changing up the diffusion model architecture from just one training phase where we you know, run the entire image through the model to two separate training phases. That's kind of starting to explain the complexity of the architecture diagram that we looked at before. Um, 
The first phase is to train a model that will take these large images, these 256 or whatever, um, and reduce them into a much lower dimensional latent space while still trying to retain as much information as possible. We'll talk about how that happens in a second. And then the second phase is the actual diffusion modeling part. So we're training a diffusion model to facilitate that denoising process. Um, and instead of operating on the whole image, we're now operating on, let's say, a 32 by 32 by eight or by three, um, you know, not image, but a, a sort of reduced representation of that image um, that still contains a lot of the core information. When we actually go to kind of compress it into the latent space, what does that mean? So a latent space, like I said, you can kind of think of in a heuristic sense as a compressed version of a, a large data object like an image, but it also could be a word or a sentence um, that kind of tries to, to represent it as, as faithfully as possible while filtering out those kind of surface level details, but focusing in on core underlying aspects. And the kind of goal with training these is that the observations which are like actually more similar and you know images that we would consider to be relatively similar to each other or things that we would consider to be similar in the real world um, are closer to each other in the latent space so you can think of this image here as projecting these i don't know 400 by 200 by three images into a two-dimensional latent space again this is an oversimplification but what we like about this projection is that the dogs have some element of dogness that is being included by the model that results in them being relatively close together um, and the same with the cats so this representation kind of seems like magic um, but just like we were talking about it was kind of it just learned as before um, through the kind of underlying flexibility of a model and, and backpropagation processes through successive training steps, which I do not, you know, have the time or like words to explain, but there's a lot of like great um, YouTube resources on it as well that we can point out. Um, another example of this that's used a lot that I like is if we're taking this image here and reducing it to, you know, it's got, it's got, 400 by 400 by three, we'll say that's, you know, 48, 480,000 numbers that make up this image. Um, what can we do to reduce it to six key numbers uh, while maintaining as much of the kind of underlying structure of the data as possible? And maybe those numbers end up looking something like, you know, this person is smiling very broadly and they have dark hair and they do have a beard and it's mostly full. So this is, you know, not stuff that's specified ahead of time by humans. It's stuff that is learned through a machine learning model. Um, but the goal is let's capture all the key features in way less of the data size. Any questions so far? What's up? Uh, yes. Uh, so the question is, uh, is the proximity within the latent space uh, an emergent property or is it an objective uh, during training? Is this some uh, something that we try to do during training or is it just the way that things are after you compress similar images, you end up with similar compressed images? Great question. So the way that we, so I would consider it more of a part of the model's objective because the way that we um, train these models is usually through something like called minimizing reconstruction error. So I'm gonna put an image in and hopefully the image I get out will be relatively close, um, as close as possible to that original image. So this three, you know, obviously has some idiosyncrasies that have gone into it from the specific handwriting of the person who draw it. Those are kind of the more like more minor surface level details that are parsed out and, and don't quite make it to being encoded in this Z here, which is the Latin representation. And then when we extract it back up, um, we're then able to get kind of a more faithful, um, you know, representation of a three. So it's kind of because we are saying, hey, you need to reconstruct this image as well as possible, given that you only have this little Latin space in which to store the information. Um, that's kind of how those properties uh, end up arising. David, what's up? For the TETS2 image generation process, this that is also encoded in this latent space. Yes, so I'm actually I'll actually scroll back up to the top architecture. So we haven't talked about that yet because I'm kind of looking at the latent space contribution as kind of just still in a pure image to image context. But if you look in this model, there is a, a kind of a, an area where you can add additional embeddings, additional encodings um, in a different latent space, right? The authors for stable diffusion or sorry, for this original paper um, used the uh, the clip embeddings or word tokenizer that is put out by OpenAI. 
Um, so by incorporating those trainings through an attention mechanism in training, sorry, those embeddings in training, you can also, in addition to just saying, make a coherent image that is representative of something in the training set, you can say, make a coherent image that is also representative of the information that we have given you um, about the image through these text vectors. So you're right, it's another level of embeddings that are fed in alongside those image embeddings. Cool. So what does this mean in a practical sense for our actual diffusion modeling? Um, it means that we're not operating on raw pixels anymore. We're operating on a reduced kind of Latin space version of the image, um, which is great for us because we'll talk in a second about how much reduction actually occurred. Um, but rather than, you know, you could think of the original input images in this paper, 256 by 256 by RGB. So that's 196,000 data points. Um, and if you move that down to a Latin space that's something like 32 by 32 by three, you're, excuse me, saving an enormous amount of compute, but you also have the added bonus of, you know, kind of conditioning the diffusion model and forcing the diffusion model by stripping out those more surface level attributes to focus on only the stuff that actually made it into that embedding space, which we would hope if we've trained our embeddings well, um, or trained our encoder well rather, is kind of the core structural information about the image that we care about as humans. And I'm kind of calling this a trick um, which it's not really, you know what I mean? It's just a clever application of a technology that already exists, but this is kind of the key lever that this paper swings on in enabling um, way more efficient training of these models while maintaining state-of-the-art quality. As for the question of how much to reduce the dimensions, very cool. The researchers did a bunch of experiments and came away with conclusions, which we love to see. That's why they do what they do. Uh, so they tried these different scaling factors, which you can think of each of these by, okay, I take my input image, I'll divide both the width and the height by this number. And that's gonna be the dimensions of my Latin space. So you can think of you know, a, a scaling factor of one um, is still encoding things into a Latin space in a sense, but it's still the same size as the input image. So you're not really achieving any meaningful compression there and you're certainly not saving computational costs. Um, whereas a 32 scaling factor, you're working with an eight by eight by three um, Latin space, which is really not a lot of information to encode. So we would expect performance at faithful recreation at that kind of F of 32 um, to be a lot lower just because eight by eight by 32, again, this is purely for representing how much data you can store in that. Obviously this is an image and not an embedding, but it's a tiny little thing, you know? Um, it's not a lot of data, whereas an F of one will actually not end up saving you that much computation time at all. So in the author's analysis of this, and I have a chart from the paper. These are two different metrics of how sort of faithful the original images were um, and, and sort of the, the um, success of the generations. So FID on the left, lower is better generations. Inception score on the right, higher is better generations, which is frustrating to look at. But what you can see is that LDMs or that scaling factor of four, eight, and six do quite well while one, two, and 32 um, do quite poorly. And that's because that, you know, the one and two, in addition to taking a lot longer, also there's a lot less compression that's going on. So you still get the model focusing on those, um, on those kind of higher level, not so relevant features early on. Whereas that sweet spot of four, eight, and 16 gets a lot of compression, speeds up our performance, but also allows the model to kind of tease out the signal. Whereas once you go down to 32, it's like, I, there's just not enough here to work with. There's not enough information, too much is being lost. Questions before we wrap it up? Okay, so we're back to this, which hopefully feels a little bit less intimidating and we will go over it bit by bit. Uh, remember we talked about a two part training process. So the first part is to train our auto encoder, which is this, I'm calling an E up here. Uh, and to do so, we take an image, which is our X, right? that could be our 30 or our 256 by 256 by three representation. We will run it through E to get our smaller Latin space. We will then take what went into there and pull it right back out through D to X with the little tilde over the top. And we'll do this a bunch of times and the model will learn to do this more effectively, right? To kind of facilitate those properties that we were talking about to capture the most information while filtering out the noise. And then after we've done that enough times, um, we kind of have trained our first part of our model, which is E, this encoder, right? Which allows us to not operate on pixel space, but to operate on our lower Latin space, which makes this whole thing possible. 
Um, and then part two, learning the actual diffuser. This is where it gets really crazy. So we take our input image X, we feed it through our encoder. Oh, I don't think you can, oh, you can't see my mouse. Yeah, okay. Um, it goes into Z, which is a smaller representation. Then it goes through our forward diffusion process where we are adding various varieties of noise and training the model to using this UNet that we've discussed earlier, a large convolutional, fully convolutional neural network to learn to predict the noise that was added to the image. Once we have that, it comes out the other end as basically something that is once again in our Latin space. We can predict it, extrapolate it back out into pixel space and see how we did and kind of um, do this over and over. When we actually want to generate a new image, I'm sorry, I got a little ahead of my notes here, so I'll let these sit for a second. When we want to actually generate a new image, we just pass in, instead of a fully noised image of the original image size, we pass in basically the representation, right? We pass in noise of the size of our Latin space with, um, as I believe David pointed out, with those texts, the text prompt along with it. It passes through the model, comes out as a latent space vector, like one of the dots on the, the sort of circle earlier with the cat and dog. And since there's a one-to-one -one mapping between those dots and images in real world pixel space, we can map those, uh, those Zs that come out over here up through our decoder um, and into an output pixel image. That is a lot. Um, so does anybody have any questions on that part before we kind of open the floor for discussion? So I think that this paper makes a lot of sense to me. I think there's a lot of machine learning papers, especially foundational ones, where I'm like, I am nowhere near smart enough to ever understand how they came up with that mechanism. Um, and this one is fun because it's a, it's a kind of state of the art model with a clear problem um, that the authors kind of took a solution that is used extensively elsewhere in the literature from you know, computer vision and other places to natural language processing, this kind of notion of reducing your dimensionality with an autoencoder. And they applied it and it worked wonderfully. And now we have the ability to kind of play with it and, and uh, advance image generation through it since it's also been released you know, through a variety of, of different stable diffusion models as an open source capability. So with that, um, definitely eager to discuss further. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about the, the training process and the reward function. Um, any questions anybody has or, or remarks? Uh, I'm just curious, like, to what extent do we know whether, like, Midjourney and Dolly use stable diffusion? Um, like, is that known or not, really? Um, I do not personally know. Someone in the chat may have looked into those architectures more thoroughly and more recently than I did. So if anybody does, speak up. Yeah, I was trying to Google it, and it doesn't seem like it's an obvious answer, but... Maybe I'm just missing something. <laughs> yeah, I think part of it too is just when we're talking about like open source models versus, mm -hmm. you know, ones that are a little bit more paywall gated. It, it is cool that we have the ability to go go really deep on these. I find with a lot of, at least some of the OpenAI text models that we've covered in previous archive dives, it's like, here's what the thing does and what we got it to do and the data that we used. Uh, but the model, here's some vague descriptions and we're gonna keep it. <laughs> keep it <laughs> Isn't it that the only thing that we know about uh, these closed source uh, models that uh, they are diffusion models, maybe latent diffusion models, but the exact architecture is outside our reach, let's mm -hmm. say. I, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Because I think they've been marketed, not been marketed. I mean, they've been advertised as being diffusion based. I think I think I remember this. Yeah, it also seems, and it, I'm also totally open to the idea that another paper has come out more recently that is is starting to disrupt this. But um, at least at the point where I remember this coming onto the scene, and still somewhat today, I think these are these are kind of state of the art. Um, so that would make sense to me. Great job today, Ben. I thought that was really well done and really Thanks. easy to follow. Um, Random question that I'm going to pose to the group, but <laughs> as someone who is like not coming from the AIML space, does anyone have like a particularly good resource for just like kind of introductory terms and stuff? Like you're going, for example, in this explanation, like it's so well explained that I can follow along very easily and I can understand, which is great. But then you're explaining something and you're like, okay, there's a UNet, and I'm like, 
Google, what do you mean? You know, and I'm like, I don't want to interrupt to ask that question because it's very basic and it kind of like takes away from, um, from the, like where we're at in the paper. But if anyone has like an intro level, like resources that is helpful, that would be great. I think, I think part of the bigger problem is that like nothing is basic. Like this is all just like wild um and and every paper like this branches off into like 20 different concepts that each have a foundational paper of their own that said um i'm gonna hunt for a link right now to a book that i think was helpful for me and then anybody else um that that knows some of those resources definitely throw them in there as well amazing thanks ben uh i found it difficult to, to keep track of everything that is happening but if, if you are really interested, you can watch like a really short explanation of every of the algorithms that are working. I particularly understand this uh, stable diffusion because I knew a new GANs unit, BQ GANs with clip that were, it's like history. If you keep track of, of what is happening like every week, sometime you will catch up because these models use other models. This is like the evolution of Piku guns and units and everything put together with clip to make steps. So it's easy to follow which you have been following with this field for like months or, or years. Of course, it takes some time, but it's, it's really interesting if you, if you start now. If you start now, at some point you, you will say like, oh, this is this is this model and this model and this model because it's the combination it's an abomination actually of, of many techniques but it's really great yep absolutely and i sent a um i sent a video in the chat that i or a, a series of videos actually that i love for the visuals it's from three blue on brown it's a really fantastic youtube channel for just like general like math education. I think every time I watch it, I feel like I come back to the forefront of having a good cogent understanding of back propagation in my mind. And then every day without watching it, I gradually slip away. Uh, but I sent a, a book as well from a series that I found really helpful from some of my stats world. Um, I haven't looked at this one directly, but I know the, the series is really good. That's super helpful. Thank you. And David, I think you're so right. I mean, just like you come across things and then everything like falls into your own mental map and mental network. So appreciate that. Also a question for those who use a stable diffusion. Uh, when generating humans, it tends to have a bias, I think, for generating like Asian and then European and then Latins. The representation of people from white to other colors is really bad. It's a star like in Asian, in Asian women for some reason. And when you try to generate something more uh, American or Latin, it's really bad at it. Yeah, so that is part of my notes that I had that I really wanna put in the public ones as well, because it's super important and relevant to what you're talking about. I kind of just left it in the words of the authors of the paper on their um, kind of real world impact statement because there's obviously a lot of good that can come out of this, but there's a lot of complexity, shall we say, as well, um, you know, from what you were talking about with like, yeah, part of that training mechanism is going to teach the model to produce um, images that are representative of its training data. And if its training data is not representative of the world, then that's the kind of outcome that we're going to get, um, which is unfortunate and I think speaks to kind of a greater need for an understanding of, of you know, how, however hard it may be to comprehend these like petabyte scale data sets that are going into training these models, I think we have to understand to, to do our best to keep them representative. So I thought that was a really awesome point to bring up. Cool. Thanks. You, you made that is similar to a thought I had, I guess, been around semantic layers. Um, it just, it feels like there's like a lot of energy where it's just it's determining what the heck a picture even is. Yeah. Uh, and there's just so much world that it could be. Uh, yeah. which is narrowing down and being like, hey, I like I'm I'm telling you this is gonna be an animal. I'm telling you this is a spaceship. I'm telling you like this is in this in starting to yeah. give it a little context or even saying like I want it to be from this part of the world yeah. or this race or ethnicity or something like giving it a little bit more and removing some of the crazy amount of energy that has to go into 
to doing the front to back process you just talked about yep. like how, how much are people how how far have people pushed in that direction i guess yeah if somebody is more familiar with this they can speak on it but outside of just primarily like i i feel like it does at least as far as i understand it come down to the data um in in terms of like you know we've <laughs> we've struggled with this at ox and trying to get it to generate a little cute mascot of like a fluffy ox that's very obviously never seen before which is a silly example but it does struggle to generate things that are like you know really out of sample or really disproportionate in the sample and i think um you know a combination of making the the data set more representative and, and sort of tagging that information in like right making sure that everything that's going in is is kind of prompt associated would in my head help with that um i could be wrong though cool thanks i think we might have to expand our calendar invite to 45 minutes oh i thought it was I'm sorry <laughs> no because each time we've run over anyway so i think we got to yeah, do it officially 45 right on um i will kill the uh recording which I think I just did.